Hello, this is your last lesson. It's Dr. Malescu, and I'm going to be teaching you chapter nine on respiratory related microbiological diseases. So let's get started. <clears throat> now that I'm getting over one, we're going to talk about um, how the respiratory system serves as a host for infectious diseases. Um, we have many, many layers of defense, including our mucus uh, membrane. We have a warm, moist environment, unfortunately, in our nose area and our nasal area, which encourages microbacterial growth. However, the mucus and the excess production of mucus when you have an ongoing infection taking place is our defense mechanism. So the site for entry for um, any kind of pathogen, whether it's uh, bacterial or viral, it enters through your um, nasal passageways unless you are breathing with your mouth open. So um, we are constantly inhaling particles from the environment, including viral particles, which is the most common reason for having an issue like this in terms of pathogen entry and infection. When the pathogen enters, it may cause inflammation and infection of the sinuses called sinusitis. The infection could get settled in your pharynx causing pharyngitis. It can also settle up into the epiglottis, which is this flap that covers the trachea when you swallow your food and it goes through from the pharynx into the esophagus. This happens a lot in small children where it gets inflated and inflamed. I'm sorry, not inflated, inflamed is what I meant to say. And um, it actually restricts and cuts off um, air supply going down the trachea to the bronchi and to the lungs. So it can be life-threatening um, when the epiglottis is inflamed. Uh, croup is a horrible cough that sounds like a, a dog barking, and again, also very common in childhood viral infections. So sinusitis is basically the inflammation of the hollow nasal passageways, the sinuses in a nasal uh, cavity, and um, the etiology is it can be viral or it can be bacterial, or it could start out as viral, and then if it uh, doesn't go away and your immune system is fighting it for days on end, you can get a superseding bacterial infection. So that happens a lot when the immune system is down trying to fight a virus. So signs and symptoms are not limited to just the nasal passageway. So you can have the nasal stuffiness and discharge, um, such as blowing your nose a lot, but you will also have pain and pressure in the face, headache. Um, generally speaking, the discharge that is mucus, um, when you have an, a, a pathogen infecting, um, if it happens to be bacterial, it'll tend to be more yellow or green. If it's viral, it'll be like a clear mucusy type of scenario. So the diagnostic is you observe the infection and see what happens. So if you have a viral infection, 10 days um, is what it takes for the viral, um, for the immune system to get rid of the virus. So it takes a while to mount an immune response with the B uh, lymphocytes, um, finding the appropriate antibody for that particular virus. So that's why um, if it is viral, we pretty much um, observe for 10 days and um, see what happens during the five day period. If, if you're worsening, um, that's clearly that the immune system is overwhelmed and then you get superseding infections, which can lead to other things like bacterial pneumonia, uh, bronchitis, things like that. So sinusitis is basically the treatable, it's treatable, but it's not curable. We don't have like antivirals per se, unless we catch it right out of the gate when it comes to a flu, for example, flu virus, we take Tamiflu right away. Uh, but other than that, um, we do uh, management. And so we manage the, the uh, sinusitis, either whether it's from allergen or sinusitis due to um, a, a virus. So what do we do? We basically uh, focus on oral decongestants um, topical decongestants, um, maybe nasal sprays, nasal steroids, analgesics, and if 
you get a superseding big if. So you need a culture. That's what you do. You do a culture to find out if there's a bacterial infection going on. If there is, then you put the patient on antibiotics. So that's um, the uh, course of the illness. So now with uh, pharyngitis, pharyngitis is basically inflammation of the pharynx. It may actually prevent you from um, talking. Uh, it is so inflamed that you may actually lose your voice. Um, so it could be viral or bacterial. And the signs and symptoms are, but not limited to just what's mentioned here. It could be way more than what's mentioned here, but um, definitely sore throat, uh, dysphagia, which is, means uh, difficulty uh, swallowing your food, uh, fever, and white patches. Um, the doctor would look and take a look down your throat and see these mucosal white patches. These are colonies of, of bacteria, if that's what it is. Um, sometimes pu purulence, pus, trying to fight off the infection. So anyway, if it's viral, it's self-limiting. So no antibiotics are needed. But if it's bacterial and you have cultured the bacteria and know what it is, for example, strep throat, then you would do uh, antibiotics. So the epiglottis, let's go over that. So the epiglottis is a flap that um, covers the trachea when you actually have the mechanism of swallowing. And then when the respiratory tract is doing its thing, inhaling, exhaling, inspiration, expiration cycle, um, you get air coming down the trachea because the epiglottis is open, it's not uh, closed. Problem is, is when it gets inflamed, it can become an airway obstruction and become an emergency, an airway emergency. This is very prevalent in children two to six years old. And usually the culprit, the etiology is Haemophilus influenza type B. So it's the four Ds, meaning the distress, the drooling, the dysphagia and dysphonia, meaning they can't, there's no sound coming out of them. So those are the four Ds. So you really want to worry about that. That becomes an emergency. So obviously uh, opening the airway is top priority and then antibiotic therapy may be um, a, a longer course, uh, definitely a 10 day course and uh, you know, reculturing and seeing if any further antibiotic therapy is needed after that. All right, so croup. Croup is also something that's found in youngsters. Um, infections of the larynx prevalent in children younger than three years old. Usually it's a viral self-limiting, but it sounds like a barking cough, uh, strider. And most of the time they may be running around like no big deal, nothing is affecting them, but it's definitely a virus and they may even be a febrile. So the best thing to do for that is air humidification, uh, administer oxygen if they're having trouble breathing and nebulizing epinephrine or even corti corticosteroid inhale uh, via the nebulizer treatment. All right, lower respiratory infections. We have acute bronchitis, acute bronchiolitis. So bronchioles are smaller than the, bron the bronchi, right? So we have the trachea, the right and left bronchus, and then dividing into bronchioles. So you can have an upper respiratory or lower respiratory infection. So um, the etiologies, it could be pneumonia, viral pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, it could be tuberculosis. So these are some of the things that um, need to be uh, diagnosed with uh, careful uh, culturing. Culture of the sputum, throat culture, et cetera. All right, now we look at uh, acute bronchitis. If it affects the bronchi, very common in the winter months, but not limited to winter months, I could tell you that. Um, living here in Florida, we have plenty of summer infections and summer bronchitis does happen and um, it tends to be viral. So uh, bronchitis definitely tends to be viral and it is self-limiting. Um, the progress is first, the symptoms may start as a sore throat with a headache and then thick, thick bronchial secretion, terrible cough, bilateral ronchi sounds uh, with the stethoscope and even crackles with the stethoscope. Um, so treatment uh, symptomatic, so treat the symptoms. If it's viral and if it's bacterial, then obviously antibiotics. Bronchiolitis, this affects the lower uh, respiratory tract, the bronchioles, 
more common in infants two to 10 months of age, often definitely throughout the year, winter, spring months, uh, definitely not as common in the summer. So the signs and symptoms, but never limited to just this, but most of the signs and symptoms, because these are infants, they don't talk, so you kind of have to figure it out. Uh, restlessness, mild fever, noisy upper respiratory breathing, right? So, you know, it sounds like really stuffy, right? And tachypnea, um, definitely possibility of, of fast breathing. Um, definite cause is RSV, and, and the only way to do it is um, watch, monitor, and treat the symptoms because it's usually a virus. There are some antivirals available, but mostly it's a uh, it's symptomatic treatment of everything, including the nebulizer. Nebulizer is the go-to for RSV. Using the nebulizer, the hood, or the mist tent, and using steroids if needed, uh, just to get that inflammation down. Okay, pneumonia. This is very common in the hospital. Community acquired pneumonia, nosocomial. Um, you can have atypical pneumonia, you could have viral pneumonia, you could have bacterial pneumonia, you, have, you can have tracheal bronchitis. So HCAP, VAP, and HAP is what we're going to talk about next in my next few slides. I'll talk about that in a minute. But let's mention aspiration pneumonia, which happens a lot in the elderly who lose their reflexes um, in that swallowing mechanism as they age. And so they can uh, choke much easier when they aspirate, they aspirate food and water into the lungs, which then um, allows the bacteria to settle, and then we have a problem. The bacteria is pneumocystis gyrovechi. Um, there's also other, um, obviously, other pathogens. Okay, so let's describe pneumonia. The pneumonia causes are viruses, bacteria, it could be fungus, and it could even be drugs and or chemicals. For example, um, my father used to be in a gymnastic school for a long time and inhaled chalk and the chalk settled into his lungs, which then um, allowed the irritation and gave him susceptibility to um, candida, which is um, a, a very terrible uh, fungus that can spread in the lungs. And having had asthma, it really settled in very easily. So how to diagnose pneumonia is an X-ray. So once the chest X-ray was done, it was visible that that's what it was. And so the only way that was diagnosed that it was fungus versus bacteria versus uh, anything else was obviously doing uh, a sputum, blood cultures, and um, sometimes they have to go and do a deep biopsy. Um, so respiratory function is determined by the need um, in terms of hospitalization, it's determined by what the respiratory function is. If your O2 sats are below 90, then obviously um, overnight stay or longer might be necessary. So let's talk about what CAP stands for. CAP stands for Community Acquired Pneumonia. So the description of infection is basically determined by the pathogens. So uh, Community Acquired Pneumonia, a common, common organism is Streptococcus pneumoniae. And, um, the determinant factor in treatment is chest X-ray results and obviously cultures to uh, appropriately treat this pneumonia, Streptococcus pneumoniae. Now, there are other atypical pneumonias, organisms that cannot be detected by gram stain, for example, or can't be um, grown on cultural media. So these organisms may or may not respond to certain antibiotics. So some of these uh, you may have heard of, like, for example, Legionella, Mycoplasma pneumoniae, cl Chlamydophila pneumoniae. So the way we treat those is empiric therapy, basically broad spectrum antibiotics that kills everything. Viral pneumonia, unfortunately, we um, may have to treat with um, antibiotics if a bacteria supersedes the initial, uh, uh, the initial infection. Um, the initial insult is the virus, so then you don't do any kind of antibiotic. But then after like, say, five, six, seven days, you're still not getting better. Then you may check and, and see and then obviously put, them, put the patient on antibiotics. So um, the PCR test, which is what we're using now for COVID, is what we use to diagnose a virus. And so we must rule out the bacterial cause. So bacteria and viruses, unfortunately, can co-infect. And I think that's where people misunderstood when it came to COVID. Anyway, 
not going to go on that route because I could talk forever about that. So tracheobronchitis, what is this? This is the pneumonia-like infection that's caused by uh, mechanical ventilation. So let's say a person is intubated. I'm sorry, my hair was falling out and tickling my arm. So I had to like find it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so pneumonia-like infection caused by um, intubation, for example. So you do a sputum production, um, the sputum sample from the endotracheal tube. So um, we'll, we'll determine the infection. So it could be like um, any kind of bacteria, depending on what the gram stain and culture uh, is determining. All right, what's HCAP? HCAP and VAP and HAP, these are all healthcare associated infections, ventilator associated infections, and hospital acquired pneumonia. So these are all the pneumonias, right? So the healthcare associated pneumonia, the ventilator associated pneumonia, and the hospital acquired associated pneumonia. So you see, this is why we wear a mask when we work in a hospital, because we can expose patients that are susceptible to infection, even if we ourselves aren't sick. So <clears throat> this is why we always wear a mask in the OR, so why wouldn't we in certain other places like when we see patients on the floor? So pneumonia is related to exposure or frequent uh, contact in healthcare settings. So I think the OR is probably the safest place in the entire hospital because it's a sterile environment. All right, so, but the floors, good luck. All right, it all depends on human behavior and whether they comply to the rules and regulations of the hospital as decreed by, you know, definite laws and bylaws of the hospital, which is in accordance with our national laws. So here we go. Preventing infections that are hospital acquired, we call those nosocomial. We wanna decrease the aspiration events in patients. We wanna prevent cross-contamination. So obviously training uh, personnel, medical personnel on how not to you know, create vectors, right? So you place your stethoscope on a patient uh, table per se, right? And the patient was eating from that table. They put their hands all over it. And now you pick up the stethoscope. You need to make sure you clean it every single time you move from room to room, or for example, disinfecting and sterilizing respiratory devices, or for example, making sure that everyone's vaccinated in the hospital against specific infections. Okay, the, the, the infections that are super important, hepatitis A, TB, and now COVID-19. Education is the most important thing for both hospital and patients, uh, hospital staff and patients. Uh, the most important uh, thing to do for patients is to prevent aspiration pneumonia. Um, the, the way to do this is to make sure that we know immediately when someone is at risk for aspiration. Um, and the two ways to have aspiration pneumonia is either um, stomach acid. So like, let's say they upchuck their food or they have terrible esophageal reflux. Um, so symptomatic therapy uh, to allow the lungs to heal if this should happen. Bacterial, so if you aspirate the, uh, the contents, um, you may actually need some antibiotic, empiric antibiotic therapy, so broad spectrum to reduce the chances of pneumonia after aspirating. All right, so pneumocystis carini, also known as zero veggie, basically is uh, due to immunocompromised individuals. So someone with HIV, someone who has like severe autoimmune disease, someone with like autoimmune disease and asthma, things like that. Uh, someone who has a bone marrow transplant is, a, is on like medications um, to prevent organ uh, rejection, people like that. So these are the people that are at risk for fungal infections in the lungs, specifically pneumocystis carini. So um, the signs and symptoms, they could be asymptomatic, but if they are symptomatic, they'll have fever, cough, shortness of breath, um, trouble um, breathing in addition to fast breathing tachypnea. So ABGs, which are doing uh, arterial blood gases, you have to go in at 90 degrees degrees 
in an artery and extract uh, blood. So it's not the easiest procedure. Um, specific IV antibiotics for sure. And then the next one we're gonna talk about is tuberculosis due to um, an inhaled organism that could be either the spore that's encapsulated bacteria in it or the droplet, the actual bacilli. And um, this infection can be very severe and deadly. Uh, they can be asymptomatic, but you'll see if they are symptomatic, they have, you'll experience severe weight loss, fever, chills, night sweats. Um, a diagnosis is the man tooth test, PPD, um, or a sputum. Uh, definitely the easiest way is the sputum specimen and even a chest X-ray to see if there's any areas affected. You'll see uh, areas with spores. You may even see um, a, a acute infiltration to the chest X-ray, uh, radio density across the lung. That's how you see it. All right, so treatment. Uh, if it's latent, preventative treatment, isoniazid it for six to 12 months. If it's in its active phase and it's um, the phase where obviously you're um, contagious, uh, the medication regimen should be six to 24 months. You need to absorb the, observe the patient, not absorb, but observe the patient because um, compliance for this amount of time to take something, a uh, medication like this, the compliance definitely goes down. All right, now we need to talk about something that's very uncomfortable to talk about, but the fact is, is that we are always at risk for bioterrorism. So some of the things that can be done to the environment to hurt our lungs, chlorine, phosgene, um, biochemical reactions of irritants causing laryngospasm and pulmonary edema. Uh, anthrax is one of them. You can have just even skin contact. Um, if you inhale the spores, it will germinate and produce toxins that can kill you. Treatment is obviously antibiotics. Other plague is another one. Um, this obviously is a little bit of a concern because we no longer have any vaccines for the plague, <laughs> literally the plague, right? From the middle ages. Um, so the transmission is uh, being in close contact with the infected individual and it is through air. It is highly contagious and it could be used as a bioweapon. If it's systemic IV antibiotics, uh, post-exposure, you just take an oral antibiotic to prevent um, spread. H5N1, we had this already in 2008-2009, uh, uh, which is bird flu, okay? And uh, lots of people I know have had it. I was a doctor practicing back then. My medical assistant had it, terribly sick for 10 days. I even knew someone that died from it. So um, anyway, it is a virus that um, is carried in wild birds in the intestines of wild birds and can be transmitted to domestic birds, including poultry, meaning chicken. And this is the main reason for getting uh, human exposure to it because we eat chicken. So it's transmitted through touching contaminated surfaces, meaning the vector. Signs and symptoms, two to five day incubation. Um, the symptoms, you don't want to get this. It's severe diarrhea, that's for sure. Runny nose, fever, cough, and severe abdominal pain. So H5N1 um, is definitely one that causes severe respiratory distress syndrome. Um, so the treatment really is only prophylaxis and supportive treatment. We do have some antiviral medications, but by no means does it resolve the situation very fast or easily. Um, anyway. Any person that is living with the infected patient is at risk because it's highly contagious. So to summarize what we did today, we talked about upper respiratory infections. We talked about lower respiratory infections. We talked about bioterrorism and avian influenza. So to summarize, we have upper respiratory infections, which are mainly due to viruses. And we treat viral infections with antibiotics only when there's a co-infection of bacteria. And the rest of the information, I would suggest that you read the book, the text and the tables for all the in-depth information that I did not present here since this was a summary of everything that you need to know. All right, Cliff Notes version.
of upper and lower respiratory infections. I hope you enjoyed my presentation and I will see you. Well, I won't see you again because this is the end of the course, but maybe I'll see you in other courses in general education science. Bye.